Fantastic. So did anybody, um, how many people in the room, uh, show of hands, trust science? Is there anybody who doesn't trust science? Oh, that's not a good sign, is it? I mean, okay, let's, let's be fair. That's not a really, that's a little bit of a disingenuous question because probably a lot of academics are in the room to begin with. And then the thing is that science is generally pretty trustworthy, but I only trust it as far as I trust the people who are asking the questions. I mean, uh, one of my friends when I, was a little, when I was a little kid, I mean, she was a half French, half English, Canadian, atheist, and she used to say, she used to bring up this thing, I don't know where she picked it up from, but it was, uh, trust in Allah, but tie your camel. And I used to love that little thing, and I, the thing is that with science, yeah, that's great, we can get numbers and everything, but sometimes we really ask weird questions. Like, for instance, um, one of the things that I've had in, in my life is, uh, well, I'm a, I'm a transgender individual, which means that uh, I was born a girl and now I'm not, now I'm a guy. So that's all clear for everybody? Yes, good. And when I went through the process, of course, I have to talk to psychologists and psychiatrists, and they ask questions. Questions like, do you hear voices? I'm like, only when people are talking to me. <laughs> That's not a good thing to say to a psychologist, by the way. <laughs> They're supposed to believe what you say, so don't do that. But, I mean, w could I not be schizophrenic and transgender at the same time? Why are they asking that question? Or my favorite one so far has been, what did you think about your gender when you were seven years old? I wanted to be a dinosaur when I was seven years old. <laughs> what did you think of your gender when you were seven? Why are they asking these questions? So, our next presenter is definitely of this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of skepticism, skepticism towards science entirely. And I said to him, uh, what would you like me to say about you? And he said, um, don't go to Wikipedia because it's full of lies. <laughs> so uh, Ben Goldacre is, uh, was born in 1974, it's a lie. <laughs> he is the author of Bad Science, and you will have to ask him personally to find out for yourself that that's actually true because it's on Wikipedia and it's probably a lie. He's basically Australian. His mom was in a pop group. He has uh, a prolific collection of reptiles, uh, is a medical doctor, describes himself as a nerd evangelist, and is from Oxford. And if you believe all that, I've got a camel for you. <laughs> All right, please welcome to the stage, Mr. Ben Goldacre. This is all extremely disorienting. Hello, look, uh, have I got any slides? Yes. I, uh, I'm sort of mild-mannered and polite and English. Um, and I can exploit that to get away with spending my life fighting. And what I wanted to uh, talk to you about today is a series of three fights that I've been engaged in. So I'm a kind of equal opportunities nerd. Um, I criticize drug companies as much as quacks and governments as much as medical regulators and journalists as much as academics. And what I find interesting is that you get the same level of idiocy in all of these different fields. It's just that the intellectual oomph behind the idiocy shifts to a limited degree. So firstly, uh, homeopathy is like obvious idiot porn. Um, I'm sure you all know about homeopathy. Uh, essentially, you take uh, uh, some of an ingredient which elicits some symptoms. And those are the symptoms that you want to cure. So then you turn it into a homeopathic preparation. You take one drop of the original substance. You divide that in 100 drops of water. You shake it. Then you take one drop of that dilute substance. You put one drop of that into 100 drops of water. You shake it. You do that 30 times until you have a substance which is so diluted that it's roughly the same as one molecule of the original substance in a sphere of water whose diameter is pretty much the same as the distance from here, where we are in this theater in Helsinki, to the edge of the sun. And then you give that to people to help them get better. Now, when I wrote that description in The Guardian, a national newspaper in England, uh, not long ago, I had a formal complaint made against me to the Press Complaints Commission by a homeopath. And he said, 
as Dr. Goldacre well knows, because people only call you Dr. Goldacre when they're telling you off, um, in between each step of the dilution process, the flask of homeopathic dilution is struck six times firmly against a leather surface overlaid upon horsehair. And this is what makes the medicine effective. And because he did not mention that, he made homeopaths look stupid. <laughs> so there's a level of insightlessness here, which obviously has to be addressed. But the interesting thing about homeopathic medicine is that it works. Obviously, it works because the fact is, when you come to take a treatment like a homeopathic treatment, uh, you're probably on the way to getting better. When you've got really bad backache, your backache's probably going to get better. When you've got a cold, you don't have AIDS, you don't have brain cancer every time you have a headache, probably you're going to get better. So regression to the mean, you will get better. But also the placebo effect. So the placebo effect is the extraordinary power of the mind over the body. And we know that people get better with placebos. We also know that different placebos can be differently effective from lots of interesting experiments comparing one placebo against another. So for example, we know that two sugar pills a day clear gastric ulcers faster than one sugar pill a day. We know that a saltwater injection is a more effective treatment for pain than just taking a dummy sugar pill, not because a saltwater injection contains any pharmaceutical ingredient that will act as a painkiller, but because an injection feels like a much more dramatic intervention. So the placebo effect is incredibly powerful. And that's why we invented double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trials, fair tests, where we take 100 people with, say, a headache, you split them in half, half of them get your fabulous treatment, whether it's homeopathy, whether it's a drug, whether it's a therapy, and the other half get your uh, dummy intervention, which in the case of a test of a pill will be a dummy placebo sugar pill that contains no medicine. Obviously, this presents interesting philosophical problems for a homeopathy trial because the real thing... Anyway, they don't mind about that. You just take the pills that were treated with the magical ceremony and the horse hair. Um, and then you follow people up and you measure them to see how they're doing at the end and then you've got your answer, right? So this is something we celebrate. We talk about this as if medicine is perfect, but in fact, in reality, medicine is horrifically broken. So the second fight is the all trials campaign. So there is this terrible, dreadful secret, or at least it was a secret until we put it on the map recently, which is that in medicine, the results of clinical trials are routinely withheld from doctors, researchers, and patients so that we can't make informed decisions about which treatment is best. Now, uh, I despise the fact that in uh, public engagement with science, you're obliged to talk about anecdotes, but I will humor you just very briefly, but I don't want you to think that I'm going to patronize you. We'll move on from the stories very quickly to graphs and data. Um, so this is a packet of Raboxetine. Raboxetine is a drug that I myself have prescribed. It's an antidepressant, and I gave it to a patient who came along who'd failed on a couple of other antidepressants, and he wanted to try something new, and he specifically brought this up. Now, I did everything that I teach in the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, everything that I teach people to do when they're approaching a new treatment. I looked it up, I found a few trials that showed it was better than a dummy placebo sugar pill, and I found a couple of trials showing it was just as good as any other antidepressant. So I happily went ahead and prescribed this drug. But unbeknownst to me, in the background, something much more interesting was happening. So ICWIG is the German government's cost-effectiveness agency. It's the German equivalent of NICE, which is the UK government cost-effectiveness agency, although the German one is much more muscular and robust. And uh, when you say that in England, everybody laughs because it's just casual racism persists to this day in the UK about the Germans. And I'm really glad that you were cool with that. You're all very strong yourselves. Um, so. The German Cost Effectiveness Agency said, we are not even going to consider looking at this drug to approve for its use in the three main insurers in Germany until you give us all the results of all the trials and their full methods so that we can see if there are any shortcomings in the design of the trial that means it's no longer a fair test of which treatment is best. And then we will put all of that in the public domain and we will make our decision and we will see what happens. There was a huge fight. The company withheld the information for many, many years. When they finally got it, what they found was... There were a handful of trials done showing that it was better than a dummy placebo sugar pill, which were all published, and I found some of them. However, there were half a dozen more trials done showing that it was no better than a dummy placebo sugar pill, and none of those were published. There were two trials published showing that it was as good as any other antidepressant, but there was data collected in three times as many people showing that it was worse than other antidepressants, and none of that data was published. And when you added all of it up, what you found was that this drug was no better than placebo. In fact, probably worse, because although it's not effective, it also has side effects, plus when you take it, you're not taking something else, so there's an opportunity cost. Now, the interesting thing here is nobody broke the law at any step, and that is the extraordinary reality of our regulatory framework around drug trials. So how often does this happen? Well, this is a really interesting paper by a guy called Eric Turner. And Eric Turner, normally you have a pointer, but here you get exercise with this ludicrous screen. Um, Eric Turner was an FDA medical officer working on Reboxetine, but he's also like a really mild-mannered guy, and uh, 
He saw that Raboxetine had appalling evidence, but he also saw that it was being prescribed quite widely around the world, and he didn't like it, but he didn't want to be a whistleblower. He didn't like the drama of that. So instead, he decided, after he left the FDA, that he was going to do an extraordinary thing. He decided he was going to do a study of all of the trials that had been given to the FDA, sometimes in secret, sometimes buried in administrative warrants, where they were very, very difficult to find, but because he knew his way around these administrative warrants, he decided he would find all the trials that had been given to the FDA for the approval of a drug, uh, over a tw uh, an eight-year period for all antidepressants. That's 12 antidepressants. So he got all these trials together. To be clear, this isn't a list of all the trials that have been done on antidepressants. Nobody can give you that to this day, but it is at least a representative snapshot in time. So after two years of fighting Freedom of Information Act, having to pay, having to show up with a minibus to take away piles and piles of paper, he got all of the studies they had. It was 74, 38 had positive results, 36 had negative results. Then, that's the reality of what they had. Then he went and looked in the published academic papers, the stuff that doctors like me use to make informed decisions about which treatment is best for their patients. Two interesting things happened. Firstly, 36 negative results, only three of those were published. So that's kind of worrying and kind of strange. Then, also, I think kind of more interestingly, 38 positive results over here turned into 48 positive results. How does that happen? Well, you know, uh, we've got the room till 11, but I don't have time to explain fully. Suffice to say that if you torture the data hard enough, it will confess to anything. Um, <laughs> you can rework a trial a hundred different ways to try and make it give you a positive result. So, how many studies like this have been done? Well, the answer is dozens. They've been collected together in reviews and systematic reviews. And the best currently available evidence shows from all of these studies where you get lists of trials that have been conducted, and those will always be incomplete, so these figures will most likely be underestimates. But you get lists of trials that have been approved by a regulator, or you can get lists of trials that have been put on a publicly accessible register, and then you go and see how many of them have reported their results and how many haven't. And what you tend to find overall is that it's a hugely variable picture, some very, very very low reporting rates, some reasonably high, but overall it's just over half in this systematic review, and it varies depending on how you slice it up. So it looks a bit like things might be getting slightly better for the most recent trials. It looks like things might be slightly better for the bigger trials, but still the figures are appalling. So for big trials, it's about 69% reported. Also depends on how long you wait for people to report. But in any case, even if the more modern trials were reporting all of their results, that still wouldn't fix the core problem for medicine because, is anybody here a doctor? Okay, so hands up if you're a doctor and you only prescribe drugs that came on the market after 2012. Right, so it wouldn't matter if reporting rates were really good for all drugs after 2012, because the drugs that we use today are the drugs that came on the market 5, 10, 15, and 20 years ago. So that's the era of clinical evidence that we need. And that's what this graph shows, but although we've got the room till midnight, I don't have to explain, but it's coming out really soon, it's really good. So, next. Uh, it seems very clear to me that fundamentally, when you've got like 15% maybe of trials not being reported, this is research misconduct. But it's research misconduct on a grand, diffuse scale, and in a way that we don't really feel in our bellies as being research misconduct. This is a kind of uh, a, a cultural blind spot throughout the whole of science and medicine. And incidentally, this problem affects neuroscience research, psychology research, and all kinds of other basic science research as well. I think. Now, for any one of you, if you were to delete half of the data points within one study, even for a 16-year-old school project, in order to make the line go a little bit more like how you think it ought to go in your final report, you would all recognize that that was research fraud, yes? Well, I'll take your acquiescence as yes. <laughs> and yet, for some reason, we don't feel it in our belly as fraud when we withhold the whole, the whole results of half of the whole studies that have been conducted even though we know that the ultimate impact on the apparent effect size of the treatments that we're prescribing is exactly the same when we do that as if we had deleted half the data points from within each individual study. Because we know, more disturbingly, that not only do trials routinely go missing in action, not only are trials routinely withheld from, the, from doctors, researchers, and patients, the people who need the results to make informed decisions, but we also know that trials with positive results, flattering results, statistically significant results, are about twice as likely to report their results as studies without. So we're seeing a biased half of the literature. So the first thing that happens when you start to talk about this is people say, well, this has all been fixed. This is all in the past. And one of the things they do is they point to regulations as if those regulations had been adhered to. And probably the most interesting of these is uh, the FDA Amendment Act 2007, which says that all trials with at least one site in the US on a currently marketed drug 
completing after October 2008, and so on and so on. But at least a reasonable chunk of trials have to post their results in summary form to a website called clinicaltrials.gov within 12 months of completion. So after this law came in, everybody said, oh, this is all fine, this whole thing, it's all been fixed, I don't know what Ben's going on about, and there's no problem anymore. And there was no audit to see if people had actually enforced this legislation. When an audit was finally conducted in 2012, we found that the rate of compliance with this legislation, which everybody said had fixed the problem forever, was just over one in five. So that's quite poor. Um, and there's been another study done of exactly the same thing in 2015 here. Again, this is the cumulative percentage of trials that report their uh, findings after they finish. And again, you can see that industry do marginally better than everybody else, although industry also do the majority of trials, so they're the people that we kind of have the most to gain from. Uh, different studies find that industry performs better or uh, academics perform better, but they're both performing appallingly badly. And here you can see, again, the rate of compliance with reporting at 12 months is around about one in five. So this is the kind of thing you get, by the way, if you ask the European Medicines Agency for information. I don't know. It's funny, isn't it? Like, intuitively, people always laugh. And you think, God, the guy working in the mailroom even must have thought, Jesus, this isn't right. I mean, I'm sending this to the Cochrane Collaboration, the global collaboration of 30,000 academics, a nonprofit that produces gold standard systematic reviews of all of the evidence on all of the important questions in medicine. And they've asked me about the results and methods of this trial. And, and I'm sending them this. Something's gone wrong somewhere. And of course, Tamiflu, you may or may not know, has become kind of the poster child for withheld data. So Tamiflu is a drug which the UK government spent about half a billion pounds stockpiling in 2008. And at the same time, the Cochrane Collaboration, which is the global nonprofit of 30,000 academics, were asked by the UK government and the Australian government, can you please look at all the evidence on whether it really does prevent flu and hospital admission? Because we'd like to know, because we're spending a lot of money on it, and also a lot of our emergency planning is hanging on it. And so they started trying to get the evidence, and what they found was that uh, Roche refused to give them the clinical study reports. And the clinical study reports are what show you whether something really was a fair test. They show you where the methodological bodies are buried. So. Progress. Uh, I wrote a long rambling book about this in about 2012 called Bad Pharma, How Medicine is Broken and How We Can Fix It, which is my most pompous moment today, and there's a lot of competition for that. Um, and after this book came out, uh, the first thing that happened was, obviously, just queuing up like bad guys, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, very disappointingly, actually, because you know, I don't think the industry are terrible, and actually a lot of what they do is just exploit structural flaws in what I would have to call, although it's not very catchy, the information architecture of evidence-based medicine. And it's kind of our fault for failing to do things properly that they're able to exploit these failures. But nonetheless, after the book came out, the first thing they did was they said, these problems are all in the past. So this chap here, Stephen Whitehead, he's the chief executive of the ABPI, the UK Pharma Industry body, uh, as well as saying things like, Ben Goldacre, the author of Bad Pharma, seems to be fixated on issues which have long been addressed. Uh, long historical trial results are published on websites like clinicaltrials.gov with compliance of one in five. Um, he's also, I have to say, like, I don't mind being smeared. Like, my parents loved me and I feel good about myself. I don't require, I mean, you know, the approval of strangers is intoxicating, obviously, but uh, I can live without it, right? I am okay with being smeared. What I expect is good quality smearing. So this chap, also after the book came out, you know, um, he would send nasty comments on email to uh, sort of journalists and stuff saying, this guy, Ben Goldacre, he's a fringe maverick, not taken seriously by anyone in the medical or academic or regulatory community. Um, and like, I'm not showing off, this just, it just happens that this was in the same year that the uh, uh, UK Health Services Journal listed me as the seventh most influential doctor in the UK. Uh, but that's just, that's just by the by, right? That's just contextual information. But also, more importantly, uh, my problem is if it's your job to smear me, and the first thing that happens after you send an email like that is that it's forwarded on to me with the subject heading LOL, then... <laughs> You know, you're just not very good at your job, and you don't know who your friends are. Anyway, uh, so, um, Sarah Wollaston, she's a lovely MP in the UK Parliament, and she used to be a GP, and she said, we have to do something about this, let's get questions asked in Parliament, and so that's what we did. And then uh, the first thing that happened was the minister said, oh, this is all fine, this problem's all been fixed at 6 o'clock in the morning to the Today programme, which is our flagship current affairs programme. By the time the question was formally asked in Parliament at midday, after lots of hurried, please don't make yourself look like a dick, emails, uh, the formal response from the health minister was, uh, yes, I do recognise that this is a serious, ongoing and important problem, and I would be happy to meet a delegation of academics and campaigners, including Dr Ben Goldacre, to discuss. 
discuss this urgently. Uh, so that's what we did. This is what happens if I wear a suit. I'm no more credible. Um, this is the uh, editor of the British Medical Journal. That's the MP. That's Carl Hennigan. He's a professor of evidence-based medicine at Oxford, where I work. And that's Ian Chalmers. Ian Chalmers is the founder of the Cochrane Collaboration. He's also a knight. Uh, he's Sir Ian Chalmers. And he keeps it so real that um, in medicine, lots of people try. Do you, do you have honors in Finland? Like the order of Finnish fabulousness or something? <laughs> So this is like, we're obsessed with this stuff in England, and uh, amongst doctors, it's called uh, night starvation syndrome, like senior doctors who really want a knighthood will do terrible things. They'll say that Prince Charles is right, and homeopathy works fabulously, and all that kind of stuff. And they also make these stupid, they, they sort of make these self-effacing arguments. They say, oh, it's not, it's not for me, you know, it's for the discipline, it's for rheumatoid arthritis. You know, I'm a professor of rheumatology, and if I was a knight, or if I had a CBE, or an OBE, or an MBE, or another BE, then everybody would take me much more seriously. Um, and so Ian Chalmers, when he was made a knight, he decided to see if this was true or not. So he did a randomized trial where he signed all of his outgoing post. Uh, it was split in half. Half of it was signed Sir Ian Chalmers, the other half was just signed Ian Chalmers. And then he measured how quickly people replied to him. And he found there was no difference at all. Uh, and he published it in a journal. It's called Yes Sir, No Sir, Not Much Difference, Sir. And it should be very reassuring for anybody <laughs> suffering from gongorrhea. Is what Anyway, uh, so we went on to Parliament, and then we did this thing that everybody in England does, which is you write a pompous letter to the Times. So there it is, and all, these, all the great and good of medicine co-signed it with me, and we said this is a real problem. And then normally what happens is people peter out. That's the end of it. You've got it off your chest. But we decided that this time, because this problem has been documented since at least 1980, people have been suggesting solutions since at least 1986, and academics and doctors both suffer from this kind of weird arrogance where you think if you just say that something's a problem and it has to be fixed, that it will just happen, even though like everything we know about saying have you considered being less obese to our patients? That doesn't work, right? Just telling people what to do. The one consistent finding from all like behavior change research is telling people to eat vegetables, they won't eat vegetables. And similarly, telling people to fix really obvious glaring regulatory flaws in the entire information architecture of evidence-based medicine probably doesn't work, right? You're gonna do something more sustained intervention. Uh, so we triggered a bunch of parliamentary select committees and all of that, and they all said, this chap, Ben Goldacre, who's ignored by everybody, was mentioned in all them and actually as the reason for triggering them, but I just, it's wrong to harp on about that. And then uh, we decided that we had to capitalize on this and we had to set up a proper campaign. So we set up the alltrials.net campaign, which you should all go along to and sign up to and get your professional bodies if you're uh, like a doctor or a researcher, get them to sign up to, or a patient, get your patient groups to sign up to. And uh, what happened? So we launched it, we thought, okay, we're going to get people to sign up to three positive statements, and then we will use them as the kind of uh, sort of rocket fuel behind going, okay, now we have to fix this, because everybody agrees with us. So we get up a three-point statement, which nobody could possibly disagree with unless they were on the side of evil, and it was, uh, all trials should be registered publicly, so that we know the trials that have happened, so at least we've got the raw material for audit to see what's happened. Then, secondly, all trials should report their results. And then thirdly, where they've been made, the clinical study report, which gives you the full details, the methodological shortcomings of a trial, which help you decide whether it really is a fair test or not. If a clinical study report has been made, then that should also be made publicly available. So uh, after we first launched, uh, a couple of days later, this chap here, he's the pantomime bad guy who says I'm a fringe maverick not taken seriously by anybody, uh, Stephen White he said, we will not respond to PR-driven initiatives such as all trials. So that was in February 2013. Uh, and then on Newsnight, the biggest news show up against me <laughs> about eight months later, he said, I've never said that. So what made Stephen Whitehead change his mind so quickly? Well, the answer is the entire British and then European medical establishment signed up to support our campaign almost entirely overnight, which is extraordinary. <laughs> And I think most movingly, uh, 80 patient groups signed up all in one go, two weeks in. And I was incredibly moved because I had gone to a meeting with them after my book Bad Pharma had come out, and uh, I was hoping that I would talk to them about like, them helping to fix this problem, and they all wanted to talk to me about how cross they were, that I had mentioned that a lot of them get funding from industry, and so there was sort of two hours of them shouting at me, and about half an hour of me going, oh, please help me on this thing. Um, and they did the right thing, right? They demonstrated their independence by signing up en masse. In the same week, GSK, the fourth biggest drug company in the world, the biggest drug company in the UK, I think the biggest drug company in Europe, also signed up. They made a commitment that they will share all clinical study reports and the methods and results of all trials going back to the beginning of the company, 2001. So GSK have done terrible, terrible things, and they do continue to do some iffy things, 
but they've proved themselves to be on the right side at least of this battle. And that's one of the most interesting things is once you start setting up a, a situation where people are either with you or against you, what you start to find is actually there's heterogeneity. There are good and bad in industry and elsewhere. So GSK, reasonably good. AbbVie uh, and Intermune suing the European Medicines Agency to try and force them to stop sharing the full text of clinical study reports with people like us, doctors, researchers, and patients. We also found, for example, because once you stand there and go, hi, we're interested in this. If you've got anything to tell us, then here's our email address, which we put at the bottom of everything we do. So then we start getting leaked memos from people saying things like, uh, here's one from FPA and Pharma, the European and American pharma industry lobbies, where they talk about how they're going to mobilize patient groups to slow down the campaign for greater transparency on clinical trials, which is pretty graceless. Uh, and uh, it didn't go very well for them because we got lots of very negative uh, <laughs> coverage for that. Anyway. Uh, so, uh, blah, 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 and the British Medical Association are doing the right thing, and the Health Research Authority are doing the right thing, and the European Union are slowly changing their laws, and the European Medicines Agency are kind of iffy, although the whole character of this entire struggle has been one step forward and two steps back. So the European Medicines Agency say, oh, yeah, we're going to make everybody share their clinical study reports, and then it turns out what they actually mean is we're going to make everybody share their clinical study reports, but you're not allowed to download them, you're not allowed to print them, you're only allowed to look at them on screen. So ICWIG, which is the German government's cost-effectiveness agency, are so infuriated. This is like a really serious like, government body of government civil servants in a country with, I think it's fair to say, a reputation for like, straight-faced seriousness generally. And they were so appalled by this, because they work with these documents all day in order to try and find out whether a trial was properly designed, to compare one part of the report against another, to cross-check and make sure that everything matches up. And they took to Twitter, right, the official German government cost effectiveness agency, to start mocking the European Medicines Agency. So this is the deputy head of this enormous body. He's saying, what? Breathing's still allowed, I presume. This aren't, this, it's not very funny, but the fact that they're trying, I think, is kind of funny, right? <laughs> And look, no, USB sticks, oh, this is terrible. And, uh, and here's what, look, he's even dressed up. That's so sweet. Um, magic, the only data retrieval method number ended. Um, and then here's another one. Oh, my gosh, she's looking through a telescope, lol. Um, you know, these people, they're really going for it. Abacus and, oh, bad lighting conditions. Can't check the endpoint definitions. Uh, it goes on. Oh, this is like the terms of use were really bad. They said if you do anything that messes with the company and costs them money, then you might be held liable. And you know that even if that's ridiculous, the cost of trying to fight against that will probably be crippling for a public body. And so here are the terms of use hanging over his head like the sword of Damocles, right? These are serious, serious people <laughs> pretending to be three wise monkeys because what the European Medicines Agency is proposing is so fucked up, right? So, that's the All Trials campaign, and that's good, and it's big, and you should support it, and it's really important. And the stupidity that we have come across with this is every bit as obviously stupid as the stupid that you come up against with the homeopaths. But there is a third, even bigger turd waiting in the toilet bowl of medicine, which is the entire fabric of how we do things is not broken, it's not irredeemable. Like the plane still flies, but it crashes a lot more often than it used to be. Now, this shouldn't give any sucker to the quacks, right? Like, just because planes crash occasionally, that doesn't mean that magic carpets work. But it does mean that there are fixable flaws. So I'm interested in statins, and I spend part of my time in, as, as my day job um, helping to run trials on statins. And I think statins are probably the best laboratory we have for understanding the problems in medicine today, because they are the single most commonly prescribed class of drug worldwide. 100 million people, at least, take statins today, and that's likely to double, treble, possibly even quadruple over the next five or 10 years. They're also the easiest thing in the world to randomize, because it's a pill. It's not like a therapeutic intervention or a policy intervention. It's just a pill, so it's really easy, really easy to do good quality trials. And also, the uh, outcome that we're trying to measure, the outcome that we're trying to prevent, is pretty much the most straightforward to measure of everything in the whole of medicine, right? We worry a lot of the time in medicine about, oh, do we have patient-reported outcomes that matter, PROMs, as we call them, um, but death is pretty straightforward, right? You're either dead or you're alive, and I think it's fair to say that death is pretty much the ultimate patient-reported outcome, and it really matters. So, I mean, it's not reported by the patient, but it, everybody around them gets very cross and upset, and they tell you this person is dead. Um, so. 
Assassins can tell you a lot. And what I'm going to cover in the next 17 and a half minutes, but it's okay, we've got the room till like two in the morning, is uh, the power of big data in healthcare, variation in care, n equals all trials. So not a trial where n, the number of people in your trial, is 400 or 2,000, but the entire population of your country and ideally the world. Informed consent, patient-driven choices, and missing data. So statins, you can already see as soon as you open any newspaper. This is the Daily Express, which is like the People's Medical Journal. One in every four of their front pages is about... Uh, health, and uh, one in four, I think, is the weather, and one in four is immigrants, and one in four is house prices. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of, like, discord. People aren't clear about statins. Sometimes they're saying they're terrible, sometimes they're saying they're fantastic, and this isn't like a one-off or a two-off, this is like a recurring theme. So, if we go right back to first principles, um, if you want to see that there's something funny and untoward going on in medicine, the first signal that you look for is, it's variation in care, and, and patterns of variation in care, patterns of variation in the kinds of treatments that are being given and accepted by patients that don't seem to be warranted. You're looking for patterns that are suggestive of unwarranted variation in care, or variation in care that's being driven by doctors' wishes rather than patients' choices. Now, my children were born in Hornsey, and this here is a graph. This is a part of North London that I can't afford to live in anymore. Um, never even think about moving to England. Uh, so, um, in Hornsey, your chances of having uh, a tonsillectomy, having your tonsils taken out, um, were about two and a half, three percent a year up until about 1928. So, about 50% chance of having your tonsils taken out before you hit 15, 16. But then suddenly, in 1929, everything changed. Children in Hornsey stopped getting tonsillectomies. So what happened there? Did the evidence shift? Did the patient population shift? Did people start making different decisions? No. The children's medical officer in Hornsey retired, and he was really into doing tonsillectomies, and the person who took over just didn't think they were very useful, so they stopped doing tonsillectomies, right? And you see exactly the same pattern in big cities. So you see, for example, in Liverpool in the 1950s, the, the east side of the city, east, the east side of the city, about 50% of kids have their tonsils out before they hit childhood. On the west side of the city, it's about 10% of kids. There's no difference in the population, it's just that the surgeons running the ENT department in one half of the city just thought, the well, tonsillectomies are fantastic, and we've got a lot of people who can do tonsillectomies, so we've got to put them to some use somewhere, let's get them taking tonsils out. Whereas on the other half of the city, they just weren't into doing tonsillectomies. Now, the interesting thing is, you can see patterns like this today. So this is a site which I've built uh, for almost no P, and it's really interesting and subversive. It hasn't launched officially yet, so for fuck's sake, don't tweet it, because the servers haven't been optimized, and it will crash, because tweeting, the problem with tweeting is people all come at once. Uh, but um, openprescribing.net, you can graph variation in prescribing across the whole of England by practice, month by month, you can see who's prescribing what, okay? So, we can see, for example, with statins. Now, all statins are fundamentally equally effective. Certainly, there's no reason to believe that statin is any better than a torvastatin. But statin is spectacularly expensive. It costs about 20, 30, 40, 50 times as much as a torvastatin. So, anybody who's prescribing statin in large amounts is probably not a very good cost-effective prescriber, right? And here is a map. We can find them. We can zoom in on them by geographic we can also zoom in them by individual practice. So there will be tears before bedtime when we launch this service publicly. Um, and what you get with these atlases of variation in care, they're kind of like Rorschach tests. You know Rorschach tests where there are patterns and it's kind of a window into your prejudices or your pre-existing beliefs and anxieties. So you go, oh my God, it's my mother coming at me with an ax or it's my girlfriend drowning me in her vagina or something like that. Um, so everybody sees a slightly different pattern and what they see reveals something about them and their own preoccupations. So for example, some people say, oh, you know, up here in the Northeast, they're so poor, uh, they can't begin to think about cost-effective prescribing, they're just keeping their head above water trying to prescribe effectively. Whereas then some people say, oh, well, look, here in Shropshire, they're so rich, they don't care about wasting money, they're just hosing money down the drain with their prescription pads. So people have inconsistent stories, but the fact is, this is clear evidence that there is very likely to be unwarranted variation in care about the choice of which statin, let alone whether to have a statin or not. Uh, interestingly, on our map, we can also, because we can look at everything, so we're starting to find that there are interesting patterns. We're going to do principal components analysis when, next week when I get back. Uh, because Shropshire, it's always Shropshire, like they spend loads of money on things that are too expensive. They also prescribe loads of Tamiflu, or Sultamivir, so they, they prescribe things that are really expensive and work, but are no better than cheap things, and they prescribe things that don't work. So uh, there'll be some unhappiness in Shropshire when we launch shortly. Um, now, can you see the same for treatment decisions about statins? 
Well, it's harder to get the data together, but yes, you can. And this is why it really matters, right? What you want is for the variation in care to be rational and to be driven by patient choice. Now, in England, there has been this spectacular battle between two different camps of doctors. On the one hand, you've had people saying, statins are ridiculous, they're a total waste of time, the benefits are so marginal, nobody would want to take them. On the other half, you've had people saying, statins are fantastic, you just take a pill and you don't die, right? That's like, there's nothing better than not dying. Now, what's interesting is, they're both talking about the same data, but they're packaging it up in different ways driven by their own prejudices. Just like the doctors who thought, oh, tonsillectomy is good or tonsillectomy is bad, rather than presenting the evidence to patients and letting them make the decision, right? Because the best currently available evidence shows that if you've got a 10% risk of having a heart attack over the course of the next 10 years, then you can probably reduce your chances of having a heart attack, stroke, or death by about 2% by taking statins. So it goes from 10% over 10 years to about 8% over, over 10 years. Now, some people look at that and they go, you're telling me I have to take a pill every day uh, for 10 years to reduce my chance of having a heart attack by 2%? That's nothing. I don't care about that. I don't know you. I'm going to take your pills. I don't want to be medicalized. I don't want to feel like I'm a patient. And so those people, those doctors, go, well, this is ludicrous. These pills, people take them, but 98% of people never benefit from them. Then doctors on the other side say, look, all you have to do is take a pill every day, and your chances of having a heart attack are reduced by 2%. That's fantastic, because death is really bad, and preventing death is really good, and taking a pill is nothing. Of course, everybody should take these pills. And what they're failing on is the basic human empathy of recognizing that different people weigh things up in different ways. And here, I think, is where things start to get interesting for modern medicine, because the characteristic of the prescriptions that we hand out today have really changed. In the past, it used to be that people came to you dying horribly of cancer or with an urgent medical problem, and you would give them a treatment, and you would sort them out, and they would say thank you very much, and they would go home, or they would die, but it was all over pretty quickly, right? Now, we're in the position to prescribe long-term preventive treatments, and the interesting thing about long-term preventive treatments is the benefits are very real, but the benefits are very modest. And when benefits are very modest, and the outlay, like taking a pill every day or being moderately exposed to side effects, becomes, gets to the point where they're sufficiently closely balanced, the benefits against the downsides, that people will disagree among each other a lot about the overall decision that they will make when presented with exactly the same information. So this is why... I and other people have been writing in editorials like this one in the British Medical Journal and elsewhere for better shared decision making. So doctors need to become more like life insurance salesmen. We need to get to the point where we have good numbers, perfect numbers that are so accurate that they're tailored to individual people that we can say, look, in exchange for taking a pill every day and this specific risk of side effects, you will get this specific cardiovascular benefit. Now, different people will make different choices, and there's no doubt about that. Like, I personally, I am appalled by death, right? I don't understand why we're not all running up to each other in the street five times a day, clutching people's shoulders close to our chest and going, did you know we're all going to die? This all stops, and it's terrible, and my children will have no dad, and the party will carry on without me, and I won't know what happens next, and I'll miss the next episode of Star Wars, and my mum will go, and my dad will go, and it's all terrible, and I would do anything to live, right? Genuinely, I, you could cut off my arms and my legs, I could be blind, deaf, um, and I would rage against the dying of the light. But I recognize that not everybody feels the same way as me. And we see this with patients making decisions about chemotherapy all the time. We see people going, look, I get it, I can have chemotherapy and I have horrible side effects and an abscess and uh, I'll feel really unwell and all my hair will fall out and I'll feel really shit for six months and it increases my chances of survival by 15% for a year and I'm just not interested, I don't care, I don't want it. Thank you very much, I've had a good innings, I'm gonna go. Other people, at different times in their life, will make different decisions. Some people will say, look, my granddaughter's just been born and she's one and I would give anything, I would endure anything to have her get to two and be able to remember me or to see her speak her first sentence. So yeah, I will have the horrible side effects because to me, right now at this point in my life, it really matters to me to have an extra six months. So everybody makes different decisions. Now the interesting thing is, we've got really good data on the extent to which everybody makes different decisions. So this is a fabulous study where they went out onto the street outside St. Mary's Hospital, and they literally grabbed 360 people of all shapes, ages, colors, and sizes, and said, look, we've got an imaginary pill. All you have to do with this pill is take it every day. It has no side effects. So this is like a 
thought experiment, and they zeroed in with different questions going, what kind of longevity benefit would you require from this pill for it to be worth your while to take it every day? And some people agreed with me. It was like five minutes. I mean, not five minutes of longevity benefit, really, but to be honest, my calculation is uh, how long does it take me to take the pill every day? And then uh, I'll value that, because I can still listen to the radio while I'm doing that. So um, that at least counts as like half life's worth of time. So add all that up, and it comes out at about two months. And just, Jesus, like, give me the statins. I'll have them now. Some people say, even if it's 10 years, I'm not interested. I don't care. Everybody else is kind of spread between the two extremes. Different people make different decisions. That's why we have to get better at giving people the data. When you're flashing nine, does that mean I'm supposed to have stopped now or in nine minutes? Oh, break the third wall, tell me. <laughs> Nobody knows. OK. Uh, flash the lights if it is OK to carry on for at least four and a half minutes. <laughs> Does that mean it is not OK to carry on for four and a half minutes? Flash if it is not OK to ca Can you flash the lights? I've still got nine minutes. Oh, great, thank you. <laughs> Professional. So, uh, if you want to make an informed decision about whether to take a statin, you need really good quality data on how effective they are. You also need really good quality data on the side effects. So, uh, here's an interesting front page from the Daily Telegraph. This time, statins have no side effects. I, I know that that's not what the study found, because I'm the third author on it. Here it is. Here. Um, and it was a good stab, right? We took all of the statin trials that have ever been conducted, uh, but only the published reports, and then looked at the frequency with which people reported side effects, whether they were getting a statin or whether they were getting a dummy placebo sugar pill. And it turns out that people who are getting a dummy placebo sugar pill report side effects to really, really high rates, right? So people report uh, aching limbs a lot when they're getting statins, but they also report aching limbs an awful lot, and an awful lot more than the general population background rate. When they're in a trial where they've been told, you might get a statin, you might get a dummy placebo sugar pill. Do let us know about side effects. By the way, people often report aching limbs as side effects, and people report aching limbs as side effects, even when they're not getting the statins. So this is well demonstrated. It's well demonstrated in lots and lots of different fields. For example, there's some really great studies on migraine pills, where there are kind of two groups of migraine pills. One tends to cause uh, nausea and dizziness as side effects. The other causes abdo pain as side effects. And what you find is that uh, people getting the dummy placebo sugar pill in trials where the active treatment was likely to cause nausea and dizziness, the people getting the placebos report a lot of nausea and dizziness, but not a lot of abdo pain. And then, conversely, the people who are in the trials where the active treatment causes abdo pain, they tend to report a lot of abdo pain, even when they're getting the dummy placebo sugar pill. But they don't really tend to report very much nausea and dizziness. So people are very suggestible. That doesn't mean they're stupid or idiots. It doesn't mean that everybody who reports side effects is necessarily wrong. It's just something you need to bear in mind. But there is a problem, because when you look at the published academic journal reports of a trial, they are incomplete. We've now got very, very good evidence to show how incomplete they are. We know that even when trials are reported in the literature, that, that academic journal reports are much less complete for side effects, much less complete for methodological shortcomings, but also side effects that become really important once a drug has been on the market for 10 years may not have been reported in the very, very early trials. So in lots of these trials, they don't even report some of the side effects that you're interested in. So that's why you need access to the full clinical study reports and ideally the individual patient data. So this is where we come down to the same problems all over again. But there's a second problem, which is we still don't know yet, firstly, how big the benefits of statins are in low-risk populations. We can interpolate it. We can intuit it from, from doing like models on existing data, but they're not very good. So we still don't know what the benefits are in very low-risk populations. But we also, crucially, don't know which is the best of the currently available statins. And this is incredibly important and incredibly fixable. So every statin that has come onto the market has been tested against a dummy placebo sugar pill, right? So and it's an elephant versus a mouse. Can you see what I've done there? Um, now, being better than dummy placebo sugar pill isn't any great shakes, right? We're not interested if a medical treatment is better than nothing. We're interested in if, in, in if it's better than the best currently available treatment. So what we need are head-to-head -head trials of statins to find out which is the best, because this is the most commonly used treatment in the entirety of the developed world. Over 100 million people every day take a statin. And yet, we have never had proper head-to-head -head trials comparing one commonly used statin regime against another commonly used statin regime in which we measure death as an outcome. 
So we have had trials like that, head-to-head -head trials where we measure cholesterol as an outcome. But there's a problem with that, because a surrogate outcome, a process outcome, a laboratory measure like cholesterol is not actually the patient-oriented outcome that matters. That's death, or at least a heart attack or stroke. And treatments which are apparently equal on a surrogate outcome, like a laboratory measure for blood pressure, can then turn out to be so wildly different on real-world outcomes like death that trials have to be stopped early. So the most obvious example of this is the All Hat trial, which compared one whiz-bang new expensive blood pressure treatment from Pfizer against a boring, old-fashioned, very cheap blood pressure treatment that had been on the market for 35 years. And that trial, head-to-head -head trial, they were both equally good at lowering blood pressure. Pfizer paid $130 million to add in their drug into this existing trial, which was a huge, expensive project with thousands of patients being followed up for seven years. In total, it cost over $300 million to run this trial. And the arm with Pfizer's drug had to be stopped early because people were dying faster than they were on the old-fashioned drug. Even though those drugs had both been equally good on the, on the laboratory measure of things like blood pressure, they had been so wildly different on real-world outcomes that it was no longer ethical to continue giving people that treatment. Now, that doesn't mean that Pfizer's drug was actively murderous, but we have to raise our game, right? Like, you were still better off having Pfizer's drug than you would have been in the year 5000 BC, had you made it to the age of 60 and required antihypertensive medication. But if it's not the best drug, then it's a bad drug. Because you want the best drug, because if one drug will save 10 lives out of 100 and another drug will save 12 lives out of 100 and they both cost the same, then you want everybody to be on the one that really works. I don't understand why that's hard for people to understand, but it is. So what we need are head-to-head real-world trials that compare the best currently available treatments and measure death as an outcome. But there's a problem here, and the problem with that is trials like that are very expensive because you have to follow people up for a really long time, and the traditional way of doing trials is incredibly expensive. But there is a way to fix this. You need huge numbers, huge numbers. If you want to detect a difference between one statin and another, then the smaller the benefit that you're trying to detect, the more participants you need in your trial. So in the UK, the government's advice for statin prescribing was that everybody at a 10% 10-year risk should get statins, but they said, we need more randomized trials to see which of these treatment regimes is the best. And I don't think they fully understood the implications of what they were asking for, but I agree with them. Because 10% 10-year risk, if you take a statin, let's say it comes down to an 8% 10-year risk. Now let's say you're expecting to detect if one statin is a whole 20% better or worse than the next. So then you're trying to detect a half percent difference, and but this is a power curve, right? This tells you how many patients... You, this is ludicrously advanced, and we have two minutes and 29 seconds left. Um, you, the smaller benefit you're trying to detect, and the more infrequent the outcome you're trying to detect is, the more people you need in your trial. If you've, if you've got a trial of whether like, a parachute will save your life out of, after jumping out of an airplane, then you're probably all right with one person in that trial, OK? Because you're definitely going to die when you jump out of an airplane. And if one person survives, you go, OK, that works. Let's not bother anymore. Right? It's only when these things are really infrequent and closely matched. That's when you need to do trials, and that's when you need to do really good trials. So if you've got people down to an 8% risk, and you want to measure a half percent difference in risk, well, if you want to measure a one percent difference in risk, you're going to need about 80,000 patients, and that's already more patients than have ever been randomized in clinical trials in the history of the world into statins. But if you want to do a half percent difference, you need a quarter of a million, and nobody has ever done that. But there are 100 million people taking statins around the world, and what we could do is randomize them all into trials. And in the UK, we have this incredible opportunity, because healthcare is provided free at point of access, paid for by the state in most countries, but in the UK, it's all done by one administrative entity, the National Health Service, and they've all got electronic health records. So we can gather the follow-up data entirely for free. We can run trials for about 50p a patient instead of $20,000 a patient, which is what Pfizer pay for phase two trials. All we have to do is when you try and prescribe a statin, a big red screen comes up and it goes, hey, we don't know which of these two is the best, statin or Ritorvastatin. Press this big red button here, your patient will be randomized to one or another. You'll never have to think about it ever again. So this is what we tried to do, and we've reported our two pilot studies. And what happened, what went wrong? So the ethicists came along and they said, no, if you're going to do that, you have to have a 20-minute long conversation with people about side effects and a seven-page long consent form that is full of legalese that even I don't understand, and I'm helping to run the trial, right? And we say, well, this is crazy because you're going to kill people 
because you're going to stop us finding out which of these two treatments is the best. And the conversation that you have about side effects with statins when you're prescribing in normal clinical care is about 90 seconds long. And these drugs, are, we know they're safe, we know they're effective, they're taken by 100 million people around the world. We just want to find out which is the best. And they say, well, I'm very sorry, you need to have a 20-minute long consent process. And so we can't do it. And here's my problem with that approach. Right? In the past, the bargain when you participated in a clinical trial was very different to what it is today. You would say, okay, I'm dying of cancer. We don't know which is the best currently available treatment for the cancer I have. I'm happy to be in a randomized trial. I will be randomized to one of the two best currently available treatments, and that will eventually produce evidence that will help save the lives of other people like me, but not me, in the future. But when I start taking a statin, I plan to take that statin for three, four, and if I'm lucky, five decades. You're not protecting me by preventing me being randomized. I want you to randomize me, because I want to be randomized into a trial of which statin is best, that is as big as possible, so that the answer flops out in a year or two, and then I want to go on the best trial. I want to go on the best statin. And I don't want to just do that for statins. I want to do that for everything in healthcare. I want you to turn the entirety of all national health systems into machines that test and learn and adapt whenever there is genuine uncertainty about which treatment is best. And that's perfectly ethical. But more than that, it saves lives. And here's the problem, right? When I was a house officer, and I'm 52 seconds over, but I will finish in the next 42. Um, when I was a house officer, I broke my leg falling down the stairs, running to a cardiac arrest at 3 o'clock in the morning, right? Nobody has ever broken their leg running down a corridor to fix structural flaws in the information architecture of evidence-based medicine. And that's because we face the opposite problem with them than we do when we're being doctors in A&E. When I was a junior doctor, I found it really tough for the first few months, right? You would be standing there performing CPR, trying to resuscitate somebody who had just been brought in, flatlined by an ambulance, dying. And their wife, who had been married to them for 60 years, was on the other side of the curtain. And you were trying to focus on remembering whether it was calcium or adrenaline. And she would be crying and begging and sobbing uh, and pleading for you to save the life of the man that she loved. And you had to learn to cut that out of your mind so that you could focus on the facts. And when we look at structural problems like the ones around trials, like the ones around missing data, we have the opposite problem. Because we can measure the mortality burden, and we can put numbers in tables, but these are deaths with the tears wiped off. And the struggle is to feel an emotional response to the biblical scale of that pain, suffering, and death that reflects the true gargantuan proportion of the deaths that we are permitting to continue. And until we do that, millions, it's true, will die. Thank you very much. Yeah. Come on out. Thank you, sir.